Hey team, it's Velasquez here and we're ready to kick off our unit on the French Revolution. So just a quick reminder before we begin this flip lecture, make sure you have a designated area to take down your notes, whether that be some paper in your three ring binder with the section for world history, or again taking out your logbook and taking out a fresh sheet of paper. I would title it again French Revolution and let's kick it off. Let's see if you can get some introduction of talking about what is the French Revolution or fundamentally what caused the French Revolution. All right, let's start with the basics here. So I put on the screen right now, what does the word revolution mean? In the simplest sense, revolution means the word change, right? It can be a political change. It could be a change in thinking. It could be a change in the way we live. Um, so a lot of times when people hear the word revolution, they go straight to fighting, revolutionary war, or of course, French Revolution will involve fighting and lots and lots of blood, which we'll get to, stay tuned. But even if you think back, we looked at, for example, the scientific revolution, right? It was a revolution to challenge the church and to ask questions and using the scientific method. We could also argue with the Enlightenment philosophers, right? It was a revolution in using scientific thinking to apply it to social science or people science, asking questions about should people have rights and liberty and um, what is the role in, in government for people and should we have equality amongst women and freedom of religion like we saw with Voltaire. So thinking about the word revolution, you know, for example, we also studied in the course, we looked at something called the Glorious Revolution. Right? The Glorious Revolution we tied to our discussion of English history and the Glorious Revolution, which took place in 1689, was so glorious in quotation marks, remember, because the English people had basically put William and Mary on the throne in exchange for having more voice in their government, signing the document that we looked at called the English Bill of Rights, asking again for uh, Parliament, the representative body, to be working with the king and queen, creating that constitutional monarchy. Now, we didn't go too far into it, but of course, back from eighth grade history, you studied extensively the American Revolution, right? The change here, of course, we have the 13 colonies, and the change that was taking place was the fact that the colonies, for various reasons, believed the government, um, the King of England was a tyrant, uh, they were um, having their rights violated, they weren't getting representation in government, and that caused them to sort of revolt and try to declare their independence, which resulted, of course, in the creation of our great United States of America. So looking at those two revolutions, we're going to try to see if we can make some connections, a little compare and contrast, and start to introduce what is causing um, the event known as the French Revolution. So before I go into that, of course, I mentioned just a moment ago our Enlightenment. Can't go anywhere in our discussion of the French Revolution without connecting the dots, um, more of that sequential events, talking about in our last piece, looking at the Enlightenment. Okay, so remember, Enlightenment thinking was that, that period of time which we see the use of logic, reason, asking questions. For example, in our DBQ, we looked at, again, the role of the Enlightenment philosophers and then the documents provided. We looked at, again, the role of individual freedom whether we looked at John Locke in the sense that he wanted individual uh, liberty and freedom in government, or we looked at Voltaire for freedom of religion, or Mary Wollstonecraft for women. So just some quotes, um, you know, how could these words inspire change? So, for example, Voltaire, um, this wasn't featured in your document packet, but, you know, I may not agree with what you say, but you have the right to defend um, I'll defend you to the death, you're right to say it, right? Kind of focusing on that freedom of speech. All of mankind being equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Remember, John Locke was the philosopher we looked at advocating for those um, natural rights, he called it life, liberty, and property in that case. Also, again, we tie to our democratic ideals. That's going to be essential as we continue on with our discussion of the French Revolution. So we haven't lost sight, for example, consent of the governed, right? In a true democracy, right, we fight ideally for the people to have voice, representation. We're fighting for individual liberty. We're fighting for the rule of law. The law is fair. It's equally applied across 
um, society. So those things are going to be tremendous as we build background for the French Revolution. When we also look at the French Revolution, we're going to talk about the leadership skills. And I pose a question to my, um, my class, you know, what makes a good leader? You might want to even just pause the video for a second and maybe brainstorm maybe five to ten characteristics, right? What makes a good leader? Someone that is strong, someone that is um, someone that is intelligent, we hope, someone that you know can command an audience, someone that is good at giving direction. Um, I would argue what truly makes a strong leader, what leadership truly is, is leadership is about service. Right? If you're a leader on the court or in the field with your sports team, right, you're serving, you're, you're collaborating, you're building that peace. If you're a leader in your community, right, you're, you're giving community service, you're, you're trying to provide, you're trying to build that, that trust. So when we look at great leaders in history, um, I would argue that we're looking for that service piece. And when we introduce our leader at the time, okay, the leader at France, which is going to be known as King Louis XVI, we start looking at the root causes of the French Revolution, one could argue that King Louis XVI was not truly serving his people. He was ignoring some major problems that we'll see throughout France, which we'll kind of get into. And he was really looking out for his own selfish interests at the time, um, financial interests, looking at economic problems in that case. So here's a document in this case. So pause for a minute. Okay, and I want you to read the document and see if you can get some better insight of what type of leader we could describe King Louis the 16th as. All right, so if you read over document B, there's some hopefully some key words that kind of jump to your attention, right? Um, he ruled by divine right, right? We looked at absolute monarchs, how they basically said their power had come from God. So he kind of uses that method or that strategy we've seen in previous monarchs. Um, he um, made and enforced laws. He levied taxes, right? Levied means to create a tax. So we saw with those documents of democracy, right? The Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights. English people were quite upset the fact that the king could raise taxes whenever they feel like it um, for a war or if they felt like the country needed financially. And we see that people, right? We want a voice in, in taxation that affects our pocket, it affects our family, it affects our livelihood. You can also see, again, strict censorship of speech and press. You can also see, again, um, he lived in his magnificent palace of Versailles, right? So we can see quite a, a few things just from this passage um, to describe what kind of leader King Louis was that could cause some problems with his um, service or leadership. We're also going to look at um, some economic problems, right? Um, a lot of the causes of um, revolution or change goes back to, you know, it's all about the money. Um, at the time, we see that France is in a economic crisis. And there's a lot of reasons we can look at why France is struggling financially. One of which close to home we could tie to is the fact that France had been America's allies during the American Revolution. Okay, so going a little bit back backstory, so to speak. Um, France and England had been enemies for hundreds of years and had many, many conflicts. Um, so we could kind of the short version of the story, of course, is that when France saw an opportunity to assist uh, the English colonies to rebel against the English crown, um, they were very supportive. So France loaned us quite a bit of money and also helped us with our military. And one could argue is one of the reasons why we were able to defeat one of the strongest military forces in the world at the time. But you know, again, of course, military costs money. And so France is left supporting America, but they have bills to pay. Um, they have um, some debt to, debt to pay back. We also see an uh, unequal tax system, which we'll take a look at. Um, taxes are high. Taxes are not equally distributed across France. Um, and really the bulk of the tax system is falling on um, the lowest or the poorest cl class of French society. Which you can kind of imagine, you're not an economic expert, but you can imagine the fact if you're trying to get money, right, you'd perhaps tax people with the most money. Uh, but we don't see that decision being made at the time. And the last bullet, bullet I want to introduce is the fact um, France also is having, you know, kind of when it rains or pours, uh, we also see a, a uh, bad harvest, we call it. So basically, you know, we know weather is crazy. 
and the weather patterns had affected crops and growing season, which had really devastated France's grain harvest. Now, grain is fundamental, of course, to make bread, and bread is a huge staple of, um, if you're talking about a poor peasant in France, um, that's pretty much where you're living on at that point. So if you're not having grain to make bread, if you don't have bread that you can eat, you're having a situation where we have food shortages, uh, where families are going hungry, you can imagine that could create some discontent, some anxiety, and some rustling of people wanting a change for French society. So pause for a minute and just kind of, it says discuss, but you know, think about why you think a weak leader possibly would motivate with these, all these problems kind of churning in the distance. Why would that motivate people to want to make change? All right. In addition to economic problems, poor leadership, one of the fundamental reasons, must, must know this, definitely write this down, definitely pause the video as needed to really understand um, why France is going to be um, moving towards a change is really towards a system of inequality. And at France at the time, we have some society structured in what we call or refer to as the three states. Now, with states for our purposes, I want you to think of it as like different classes. You have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class, or everybody else. So the first estate is going to be referred to as the clergy. And the clergy is going to be basically the people that are working within the church, right? The cardinals, the bishops, the priests. They make up a tiny fraction of French society, but they play a major role in terms of um, their influence. The second estate is going to be referred to as the nobility. The nobility are usually the people, the aristocracy, the people with land, the people with money, the people with title, power, um, would be working, would be living, going to the fancy parties at the Palace of Versailles. And I put dollar signs there to remind you, these are the people that have extreme amount of wealth. Uh, we're talking lavish um, manners and estates, um, you know, lavish outfits. You know, you think about the period of, of dress at the time. And we say roughly the, the third or the second estate, excuse me, makes another small fraction. It's about maybe 3% of the population. Okay. Most of what we see in French society falls into what's called the third estate. Now, I want to be careful here because the third estate really is the bottom tier. However, within that tier itself has different layers or different levels. And the third estate at the top tier, you have a group which are known as the middle class. Now, for our purposes, right, we think, okay, uh, upper class are the people with money, middle class in the middle, and then the poor people at the bottom. But the middle class are kind of smushed down in that third estate category. The middle class is referred to as called the bourgeoisie. Okay, the bourgeoisie are those middle class. And those are the ones that are really, um, they're educated, they might be business owners, they might be shopkeepers, they might be craftsmen, traders. Um, so they're the people that, again, have money, but they'll never be to the level of the second estate. The second estate, you really have to be born into, to that land, that title, that nobility, aristocracy. So the bourgeoisie is always kind of kept in that bottom tier, and there's no way for them to um, step out of that tier, which is strange for us, right, because we tell people all the time, you know, work hard, save your money, get an education, be successful, right? You can... You can grow your empire, you can make money, you can rise. But the frustration of French society is the fact that you're always kind of kept in that bottom bracket. Okay, down in that bottom bracket, we also have, you know, we have workers in the cities and towns. We have farmers, we have peasants. So pretty much that bracket's pretty fat. You say roughly about 90 something percent of the population would fall into the third estate category. So take a moment here and let's analyze this chart. And this is a strategy I use in my class all the time. It's called OQI in this case. Okay, so what do you observe in the chart? What questions could you ask about the chart? And what do you think the inference is? Meaning, what do you think possibly, if we're talking about the word revolution, right, the coming of change, what could be some reasons why the third estate or a French society is looking for a change at the time based on this graph that we take a look at? 